Hi there, welcome to my channel Cyber Hashira. Today I'm going to start a new series of tutorial on PKCS 11. It is one of the standard defined in PKCS. There is a video about PKCS on this channel. Watch that video if you want to learn more about it. In this video, I will give you an introduction to PKCS 11. Let's dive into it. Now before I begin, I think I should clarify who this tutorial is for because the content of this tutorial may not be for everyone. So if you are using a hardware security module or if you are in a profession where you must directly or indirectly work using an HSM, then this tutorial is for you. If you are a developer who wants to understand how an app application talks to a hardware security module and you want to develop application that uses an HSM, then this tutorial is for you. You should also learn PKCS 11 if your job requires you to support a client who uses hardware security module. For example, um, if you are in a help desk or support or pre-sales or maybe some kind of consultant role. And if you are a hobbyist who just wants to learn PKCS 11, then that is also fine. And these are some of the things that you can expect from this uh, tutorial. This tutorial is going to be a series, which means there's going to be uh, more videos about PKCS 11 after this. PKCS 11 is a vast topic, which I'm sure cannot be taught in just one video. There's a lot to learn and understand about PKCS 11. So by the end of this tutorial, you will have a good understanding of PKCS 11. You will learn how an application uses PKCS 11 to talk to an HSM. And this also means that you will learn a few things about hardware security modules itself. And if you are a developer, you will be more comfortable writing codes that uses PKCS 11 API. And if you're still with me, I will now start explaining what PKCS 11 is all about. PKCS 11 is one of the standards developed by RSA Security along with other standards in 1994. The first version of PKCS 11 was published in 1995. After that, many revisions and amendments were made, which eventually led to version 2.20. PKCS 11 version 2.20 has been the most popular and widely used version of PKCS 11. Many HSM vendors implemented version 2.20 Meanwhile, RSA continued to improve version 2.20 for a few more years. In 2009, RSA opened version 2.30 for review. However, it was never published. PKCS 11 was eventually handed over to OSS. OSS continued from where RSA had left. After almost a decade of work, the next version of PKCS 11 was finally published as version 2.40 in 2015. The latest version of PKCS 11 is version 3.0, which was published in 2020. And that's the history of PKCS 11. PKCS 11 is a platform independent API used for performing cryptographic operations on a hardware device. This hardware can be a smart card, a USB token, or a hardware security module. PKCS 11 provides a low level interface to perform various crypto operations on a hardware. A developer can make use of PKCS 11 API to write an application that can utilize these hardwares. PKCS 11 defines many algorithms, different kinds of objects, and various functions for all kinds of crypto operations. And being platform independent, PKCS 11 API works the same for all operating systems. The hardware device that performs a crypto operation is known as a token in PKCS 11. Therefore, PKCS 11 API is also known as cryptographic token interface or just crypto key. Now let's dive a bit deeper into PKCS 11. The picture that you see is the model of PKCS 11 as described in the document they published. There is a link in the description of this video for PKCS 11 documentation. You can refer to their HTML document or just download the PDF version for your offline reference. The link I provided is for PKCS 11 version 2.20. In this diagram, at the top is an application which wants to use a hardware token. There can be multiple applications which are trying to use that hardware. 
The request for crypto operation from an application first goes through the usual security layer such as access control, permissions or firewall. The crypto key library receives those requests from the application and then passes them to the hardware device. Now this library can be a DLL file on Windows or a shared library on Linux, an SO file. Once the hardware receives those requests, it would process them. After it finishes processing those requests, it would send the process data back to the application along with a return code. I will talk about return code later in this video. The process data depends on the crypto operation that was requested by your application. It could be uh, it could be encrypted data or maybe a signature. It could be a hash, a decrypted data, or it could just be a key. The device that performs all crypto operation and keeps all your keys is known as a token. Now, this token can be a smart card, a USB token, or a token from a hardware security module. These tokens are available in a slot. Now, a slot is simply a physical interface where a token is connected. Let me explain this more clearly because I will be using terms such as slots and tokens frequently in this tutorial. We are now getting into more technical aspects of PKCS11. A slot is a physical device where a token can be connected. For example, a smart card reader is a slot. A smart card connected to it is a token. Similarly, a USB port can become a slot, but when a USB device is connected to it, it becomes a token. A smart card reader without a smart card is just an empty slot in PKCS11. A smart card reader with a smart card connected to it becomes a token ready slot. Similarly, a USB port without a USB device connected to it is just an empty slot. But when you connect a device to it, that slot becomes a token ready slot. There can also be some scenarios where a slot always has a token present in it. For example, a uh, network HSM, a uh, PCIe HSM or a uh, cloud HSM does not need a physical plug and play slot. So PKCS11 sees these devices as a slot which already has an active token present in it. Let's talk more about tokens. A token is where all the magic of PKCS11 happens. All cryptographic operations such as hashing, signing or encryption happens inside a token. A token also has a secure memory where it stores all cryptographic objects. An object in PKCS11 can be classified as a data object, a key or a certificate. A key can be a public key, a private key or a secret key. And all these objects are defined as an object class in PKCS11. I'll talk about these object class later in this tutorial. An object in PKCS11 can be classified based on their access requirement. They can be called public object and private objects. A public object can be accessed by anyone. It does not matter if they are authenticated or not. Now, please don't confuse them with a public key. The keyword here is authenticated. A public object can be accessed by anyone who is or isn't authenticated. A private object, on the other hand, can only be accessed by someone who is authenticated. It can only be accessed by a user who has successfully logged in. An object in PKCS11 can also be classified based on their state. They can be called a session object or a token object. A session object is ephemeral. They are temporary. They only exist until an application is still running or while a session is active. Session objects gets destroyed immediately after an application or a session closes. Token objects are persistent objects. They persist. They continue to live on even after a session is closed or an application exists. They will continue to exist even after a token is disconnected. So if you hear me saying session objects, think of them as temporary objects. And if you hear me saying token objects, Think of them as persistent objects. There are two users in PKCS11, a security officer and a normal user. Think of security officer as an administrator. They do administrative tasks such as initializing the token, setting password, resetting password, performing firmware updates and uh, changing security policies and things like that. 
Normal users are limited to cryptographic operations. They can generate keys, they can do signing, they can do encryption, they can hash, they can do key derivation, those kind of things. What you see on your screen are some prefixes used in PKCS11. This is not a complete list. I have only listed the ones that are frequently used. You will need to know them and understand what they are. Let's start with C underscore. These are functions in PKCS11 that perform some operation. Most of them are cryptographic functions, but there are some management functions as well. On the left are some examples of PKCS11 functions. C encrypt, C sign, and C generate key pair are cryptographic functions, whereas C init token and C set pin are management functions. Next is CK underscore, which is a prefix for a data type or a constant. On the left are some examples. I will talk about these data types in a later video. CKA is a prefix for an attribute. Attributes are used to define the property of a key. Some examples are on the left. CKM underscore is a prefix used by mechanisms or algorithms. For example, CKM underscore SHA-256 underscore RSA underscore PKCS is a signing algorithm which is known as SHA-256 with RSA. Some other examples are on the left. There is a long list. I won't be covering them all, but I will talk about them in a future video. And that's one reason why you should consider subscribing to my channel. So you don't miss out on those videos. CKO underscore is a prefix used for an object class. Some examples are on the left. CKO underscore secret underscore key is a class used for secret keys such as AES and DES. Similarly, CKO underscore private underscore key is a class used by private keys such as RSA and ECDSA. CKK is a bit more precise compared to CKO. CKO is used for identifying an object as private key or a secret key, but it does not say which type of key. CKK is used to specify the type of key, and some examples are on the left. CKR is a prefix for return codes in PKCS11. Whenever a PKCS uh, function is executed, it returns a CKR code. A CKR code tells if the function completed successfully or whether it failed. So, for example, CKR OK is considered a success. Any other CKR code is mostly considered a failure. Let me give you an example. If you are trying to verify a signature, CKR OK would mean the signature was good, whereas CKR signature invalid would mean that there was a mismatch in the signature. Similarly, if you're trying to log in and that login was a success, then you would get CKR OK. However, if your PIN or your password was incorrect, then you would get CKR PIN incorrect as the CKR code. Again, there's a long list of these return codes. I will be talking about most of them in a future video very soon. CKU prefix is used by a user type. Um, on the left, you see some examples. CKU SO is for security officer. CKU user is for normal user. CKF is a prefix used by flags. Flags are used to specify the capability of a token or a slot or a session. They will be covered soon in a future video. The next important thing that you need to know about PKCS11 is session. A session is a logical connection between an application and a token. Think of it like a phone call that your application makes to a token. If you need to talk to someone from customer service, you would dial a toll-free number and, you, and your call gets routed to an available customer service rep. You both be then exchanging questions and information back and forth. And once you have what you need, the call ends. It is something like that with sessions in PKCS11. If an application needs to perform some crypto operation, then it would first open a session with that token and then pass all requests for crypto operation through that session. A session is required by almost every function in PKCS11. There's not much you can do without opening a session. A session can have one of any two states. It can be either read-only or read-write. 
An application can open one or more sessions when required. For example, a multi-threaded application can open a separate session for each thread. An application can also open one or more sessions on multiple tokens simultaneously. However, the number of sessions that you can open on a token could be limited. It could be a hard limit set on that device by the manufacturer or it could be limited by the available memory on the token. A session is identified by a session handle. They usually start with one and it keeps increasing as you uh, open more sessions. The numeric value is an unsigned long value. And now I will talk about the sequence in which various functions are generally executed by a crypto key application. The first PKC11 function that an application may execute is C get function list. This function returns the list of all available function in a crypto key library. It's kind of like going into a restaurant and asking for a menu to see what's available there. An application would use C get function list to do exactly that. C initializes technically the first function for any PKCS11 based application. You cannot do anything on a token without first calling C initialize. C initialize function initializes a crypto key library. It also allocates address space for an application and gets all information required for the next step. Think of it like turning the ignition key to start a car. C get slot list function is used for getting the list of all available slots. This function can also look for slots with an active token. C open session is used for opening a session. After a session is open, this function returns a session handle number. This session handle number is used by other PKCS11 functions to perform various operations. C login is used to log in to a token as a security officer or a normal user. Once a user is logged in, a token is ready to execute whatever cryptographic operation an application wants that token to execute. Opposite of C login is C logout. C logout logs you out. So once an application has finished using the token for whatever operation that an application has requested for, it is a good practice to simply log out from that session. C logout does exactly that. C close session is used for closing a session. And after an application sees that it no longer needs to use crypto key, it would call C finalize. Calling this function would result in the release of all allocated memory by the crypto key library. The session that is still open will get destroyed. Session objects will get destroyed. Your application would no longer be able to use the token. It's kind of like an application saying bye to a token. And now it's time to call C finalize for this video. That's all I have for you in this video. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new from it. Leave a like to this video if you liked it. PKCS11 is a vast topic, so I will be uploading more videos about this topic to my channel. More videos will be coming out soon, so please don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you're new here. And as always, uh, thank you so much for watching and I'll be talking to you soon in my next video. See you finalize.